Today I'm proclaiming the word of God from the Gospel, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, through the Spirit-filled words of your Son, give us great joy, so that we may rejoice in his presence with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, let's get straight into the text. Here's how it begins. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee. The eleven disciples. Of course, if we are familiar with the Gospels, with the four accounts of Jesus' life and teaching, we know that Jesus chose twelve disciples. And if we are familiar with the Old Testament, we also know that there were 12 tribes of Israel and that 12 is the complete number representing the community of God's people. And yet only 11 disciples, only 11 of Jesus' students, of his apprentices, go to Galilee. Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, is not with them. So the number is not complete. And this incompleteness is the result of human sin, of betrayal. And yet we are going to see what God can do with what, from a human point of view, is imperfection and lack. Human sin, human incompleteness, does not hinder God's work. Let's hear again. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Note how the eleven disciples act according to Jesus' word. They go to the place he directed them to go. The text does not say what they are expecting to find, but it will make clear what they do find is Jesus himself. As they obey the word of Jesus, as they go to where he appoints them to go, they encounter Jesus in his resurrection, in his new life. This is good for us to keep in mind as we reflect on where Jesus calls us to be and to be open to encounter Christ in his risen life, as we live faithfully in our vocations, as we live in the callings that our Lord has given us. Now what comes next is both surprising and encouraging. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. In Galilee, at the appointed place, they see Jesus. Now the focus of this text will not be on what Jesus looks like, but on what he says and the assurance that he gives. Nevertheless, we have here a picture of the disciples first worshipping Jesus. Now, how should we visualise this? It seems to me, it seems to me, that we should visualise the disciples kneeling before Jesus even prostrating themselves before him. Now let your mind dwell on this picture for a while. The disciples worship, they kneel before, they prostrate themselves before the risen Christ, before Jesus, the human being born of the Virgin Mary, the one crucified under Pontius Pilate and now risen from the dead. Jesus is the object of worship for the church. Back in the temptation narrative in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had said to the devil, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And so in the action of the disciples, we see a confession of faith that Jesus is not only a human being, but also true God. 
But note that the text adds these surprising words, but some doubted. In the scriptures, there is a close relationship between faith and doubt, between having Jesus present and not recognizing him. Think of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Their hearts burn within them as they hear the risen Jesus teach about himself from the scriptures. But they only see him in the breaking of the bread and then he disappears from their sight. You read about this in Luke chapter 24 verses 13 to 25. Or think about Mary at Jesus' tomb. She thinks that Jesus is the gardener until he calls her by name. You'll read about this in John chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Or think about Thomas, who makes an outrageous confession of doubt, who vehemently declares his unbelief in the resurrection of Jesus, stating that he will only believe if he puts his finger in the mark of the nails and his hand in his side. And yet who continues to meet with the community of disciples. And he encounters the risen Christ with that community on the next Sunday. And makes the great confession of faith, my Lord and my God. You read about that in John chapter 20 verses 24 to 29. All this is encouraging for us in our life together. Together with faith and with true worship of Jesus, there is doubt in the Christian community. And this does not stop Christ sending his church to all the world. It does not stop the church making disciples. And it does not stop Christ being present with us. So rather than be anxious about our doubts, we are free to receive Christ as he comes to us. Now listen to how the text goes on. And Jesus came and said to them. In Matthew's gospel, only twice does Jesus step forward, does he come to his disciples. First at the transfiguration, where he steps forward to his terrified disciples, where he touches them and tells them to get up and not be afraid. Here he speaks in the face of the disciples' doubt. Jesus gives his authoritative words, what we know as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's pause here. The primary focus of the Great Commission that Jesus gives his church is not on what we have to do. The primary focus is on who Jesus is and the authority that he has. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. When someone in this world has authority, they can go where they are authorized to go whether it is to sit on the bench as a judge or to take a seat in parliament or to teach in school. Authority means freedom to exercise rightly ordered power in the right place. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. There's no place that we can go where Jesus does not have authority where he does not exercise his rightly ordered power. He can open doors that would be closed. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. When someone has authority in this world, they can command those under their authority, whether it's a general commanding a captain or a surgeon directing staff in an operating theater or a parent Telling their child to eat their vegetables. Authority means freedom to command. 
and Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth to command and to hold to account all who would disobey. There is no earthly or spiritual power that we can encounter that is not under the authority of Christ, who is not accountable to him. It is because Jesus has all authority, it's on the basis of his rightly ordered power that Jesus commands his church, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In his ministry, Jesus had made disciples by calling people. Remember that many people tried to make themselves Jesus' disciples, to be his students, to be his apprentices. But it is only those whom Jesus called who had the freedom to get up, to leave everything, and to follow him. Jesus now extends this powerful call through his 11 disciples and through them to the church. And the call is not limited to those in Galilee, or to those in Judea, but to people of all nations. And how is the church to make disciples, to make students of Jesus, to form people as his apprentices? Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The church makes disciples, first of all, by baptizing them into the triune name of God. Let's say someone buys shares in your name or buys property in your name. They are making the shares or the property yours, your possession. Now, baptism with water in the name of God does not look impressive but it is done with Jesus authority and it makes those who are baptized in the name of the triune God the possession of the triune God we find our identity as people loved by God as people who call out by the spirit to God the Father through our baptism into Jesus and it's through baptism that people begin their apprenticeship with Jesus. And it's as apprentices, as students, as disciples, that we receive and hand on Jesus' teaching. The church is called to teach disciples to observe, to keep everything that Jesus has commanded. This teaching is a lifelong process. In many respects, it's not glamorous. It involves patience from the teachers and the taught. It involves repetition. It involves teaching by example. It involves teaching not one's own opinions, but the words of the Lord, like the words of the Sermon on the Mount, where we receive Jesus' teaching about dealing with anger, or the need to forgive, or the sanctity of marriage, or the right way to pray. It also means teaching the command of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me, something that we wait patiently to celebrate again. Jesus' last words to his disciples are not command, but assurance. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. As we go on the path of faith, making disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching, we are not alone. The Lord Jesus is with us and time itself is no barrier. Jesus' authority extends also over time. He is with us always, even here, even now. Let us therefore worship him, even in our doubt. Let us receive his call to make disciples, and let us rejoice in his presence, the presence 
of the one who gave his life for us and how and who now lives and reigns with the Father and the Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen.